Welcome to the Win Make Give Wealth Series. This is Ben Kenny joined with Chad Himes, Bob Stewart, and this man in the behind the mics, uh, Dave Weldon. We are, gentlemen, we are really far into the wealth series. I think we are on part 11. We're actually on part 12 right now. Ben. That's how far in we are. We're so That's far in. How far in? We're we on 12. No kidding. No kidding at all. Well, either way, we are in the second part. That of is accurate. The real estate investing bucket. Yes, advanced real estate strategies coming up. And if you made it through the first one, you're a diehard because it was like an hour long. <laughs> and we talked about buying five homes in 10 years and 10 homes in 20 years. And we and did lots of math. Cap rates and cash on cash returns and financing types. And our brain hurts from it. This particular episode, you're going to get to meet one of my close friends and, and learn about investments that we've made and that I've made separately and they've made and, and just talk about examples. The different parts of the U.S. that you could invest in, the types of properties, the types of financing, and the types of returns you could get. I'm really excited to have some advanced real estate investing conversation today. Uh, guys, you got anything you're really excited about? I can't. Like, this is stuff my wife and I – Ben are on the cusp of kind of going to that next level. I'm super excited about the the long distance investing. Like, like what are some of those markets? I know you mentioned Birmingham in, in the previous episode that you've you've bought into. Like I'm I'm Aaron and I are at that place where that's probably one of our next moves. So I'm excited about that piece. Love that. I, I'm just excited to hear some new strategies. We Nita and I have taken on a few of the strategies. Some of them have have not gone as well as we wanted them to go, or some of them put us in a situation where we were forced and we made a change or a decision. I'm just interested in some of the new strategies and different strategies we're going to dive deeper into. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on the last section of the wealth series, we dove in to the real estate investing bucket. I spent a lot of time talking about what happens to you if you buy five homes over 10 years or 10 homes over 20 years. We, we learned about cap rates and internal rates of return. We started talking about the benefits of investing in real estate as one of the five buckets that we talk about in the wealth series. Today, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into real estate investing. And I've invited my friend and partner, Brian Gubernick from Scottsdale, Arizona to come and talk to us because he's an experienced real estate investor. Brian, thanks for joining me today. Ben, thank you for having me. It's an honor to uh, play a small role in the Wealth Series. You guys have brought so much value to all the listeners, and I, I hope I can do my part today. As I understand it, you've actually been going through the Wealth Series yourself so far, haven't you? I, I have. Um, I, I seriously have gone through every single episode and have been into the workbook. Uh, and it's funny, right? Like I'm actually, I would consider myself someone that maybe is a little bit more experienced or um, it does work through a lot of these exercises on a regular basis and has been doing it for a while. And even for me, starting from the first episode, Ben, it wasn't like, you know, only a couple of things felt applicable. Starting from the first episode, every single thing, every single episode, I picked up something that I brought home Either, either to my office or to my family or to my kids. Um, last Wealth Series, Ben, uh, my, my daughters, I did not feel were maybe old enough to grasp some of the conversation, but this time around, it's been really meaningful around the dinner table. So uh, I have been following along uh, with each and every episode. Well, well, thank you for being a contributor to the Wealth Series and also a participant of the Wealth Series. I know it means a lot. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Brian and I are business partners. We own uh, an organization an organization called Metrics Masterminds, and we get together four times a year for two days straight, and we teach things about wealth building and leadership and health and business and just kind of self-mastery. And, and one of the reasons that I invited Brian here is because he's worn all of these hats. He's owned real estate brokerages. He's been a real estate uh, agent. He's owned title companies and mortgage companies and all types of businesses. But at the end of the day, what I consider Brian to be most 
is an investor, an investor of businesses, an investor in the stock market, an investor of real estate. But today, we are really going to pick Brian's brain on what it is to be a real estate investor. What does he look for in investments? Where in the world is Brian currently investing or where has he invested? And we're going to jump through some actual transactions that Brian's done over the years. And, I, and I'm really, really excited. So let's kind of start off, Brian, with uh, when did you make your first real estate investment? How long ago was that? Uh, first real estate investment for me, uh, it kind of the traditional story you hear with many, <clears throat> where I was working in office job, make my first job, making a salary, saving, not to the extent I probably should have, having gone through the savings episode of the World Series, but saving. And then I allocated those dollars to a new build. I was totally uneducated, Ben, but I had allocated those do dollars to a new build in Scottsdale, a new build condo. Uh, this would have been 2004 for me. Okay. And I'll fast forward. I had that experience that many may have where I uh, bought that property and immediately sold it. There was no restrictions on that. So the construction was done. I sold it and I made more money selling that new condo that I had a deposit on than I had made in my entire year as an accountant, wow. as a staff accountant. Wow. So um, instantly was uh, bitten, you know, I was bitten by the, the, the investment bug. In Phoenix, Ben, when you don't know what you really want to do with your life, you become a real estate investor. So I also had that going for me. Right. That's just what we do. So my first deal was 04. And sincerely, like I, after that experience, um, I had decided, okay, it's time for me to go become a, you know, an entrepreneur, um, operate for myself and focus on real estate investment. But I want to be very clear. Um, that first one worked out for me really well, even though I was totally uneducated and really didn't run the math. It just seemed like a good idea. And I was a risk taker. Uh, I only had myself, my Labrador and my condo to worry about at that time. So I was able to do that and it worked out favorably. I learned the hard way over the next few years after that, that you got to better understand the math behind your transactions. Yeah. And you've really become a teacher of the math around real estate. And I've seen you teach thousands of real estate professionals and thousands of small business owners and just regular Joes and, and Jans about what kind of math they should do. When, when you think about making an investment in real estate, what is some of the things that you look for? Like, what is it that you want out of that investment at, at the highest level? Let's, let's start with that. Um, you know, I, I think I got to build to that a, a bit, Ben, because if you don't mind, right? So when I started investing, or, you know, I, if you could see me right now, like I'm using the air quotes, right? When I started investing, my mindset around investing was to do what those around me were doing. And what those around me were doing were flipping properties, and speculating on new builds like I had done myself. That was what, again, in my backyard in Phoenix, that's what so many were doing, so many close to me. So when I started into the real estate investment world, I thought investment meant go buy a home, fix it up and sell it for more, or go buy a home, let it be constructed and then sell it for more. I thought that was the game. At that time, my motivation was income. I wanted to generate job income. Right, I left my job, so I had to replace it. And the rate, way to replace it was to do things like flips, you know, rehabs of property, sell them for more, and speculative new build type activities. Um, after I had gone through that, and I had made some money and I had lost some money, and you could see for those that have been around long enough, I mentioned I started in this in 04. Uh, well, in Phoenix, we had quite an interesting run in about uh, 06, 07, 08, 09, right? And we won't spend time on that. But I learned what it meant to, <laughs> I, I, I learned what a shifting market meant and that my flipping income was in jeopardy because deals or supposed deals were not simple to find. So fast forward, after that experience, after I was flipping for some time and I was doing this spec, you know, I, I really had to kind of take a step back then and assess what, what game am I even playing? Like, what is the objective? 
what am I truly trying to achieve with this real estate investment business, if you want to call it that? Again, I was doing it for job income, but that wasn't really investment. That was just another job as another way for me to earn money. I had figured out, what am I playing this game? Well, I'm playing this game to accumulate assets, but specifically to accumulate ass assets that, as you've defined so many times throughout the wealth series, that cash flow. And the cash flow was, you know, a passive income play. Like many around that time, you included, you know, there was one book that stood out, you know, uh, to me, and it was the one that was top of the pile. And that was the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, book that if you haven't run through, you probably should, right? And that was, I mean, it sounds like cliche, but that was the book that got my head around what investment really looked like and how passive income was my place. So Ben, today, fast forward all those years. Today, I really think that when people invest or even when I invest, I'm looking at really kind of two major metrics, if you will. I'm looking at the cash flow I can generate, the passive income, and I am considering then the appreciation or potential appreciation, the equity that can grow in that property over the course of time. However, right or wrong, I want to be very clear, at least from my perspective, my strategy, I am cash flow passive income, far and away number one, and uh, a very, very, very distant second, and maybe even third, in that it might rival tax advantages as a, as a reason to invest, uh, but a very distant second or maybe third would be equity. In other words, appreciation over the course of time. I do not care so much about the property value and what it looks like on my net worth statement, bit, Ben. I am more concerned about the freedom created from the passive income I could generate. Cool. So let's let, let me think about this dialogue you just had. Mm -hmm. Number one, you said when you started investing in real estate, you were flipping properties. But to the, to you, that was just income because you spent your time instead of working at, as an accountant, you spent your time being a flipper. I am with you, Brian, because I don't think that flipping real estate is investing. I think investing is when you hold things and they generate, as you pointed out, passive income. And that may be contrary to a lot of other podcasts and other places that you list, listen to. Nothing wrong with flipping a property, but it's not wealth building in my opinion. And this is the wealth series. So we're going to focus on building wealth, which as Brian pointed out, uh, comes from cash flow and passive income, appreciation over time, tax benefits. And the only fourth one that you didn't mention that I consider, Brian and myself, is what instant equity am I getting? Like, am I buying it under value? Is there a hundred grand in equity on day one that might be of interest to me uh, over the long term? So great, thank you for taking taking that list. Is everybody? He's talking about acquiring assets that create cash flow. In the wealth series, we call that flipping the triangle. You're moving from having assets that that that, that you're moving to having assets that create. Uh, income. Awesome. So you've done a lot of investing in Arizona, which is where you were raised and grew up. I imagine you've bought homes in Phoenix and Scottsdale and uh, all over that general vicinity, right? That's, that's right. I, I, I think for anybody getting started, it would be wise to invest in what you know, invest in your backyard, and Again, this is my opinion. I'm not saying this is necessarily the opinion you hear across all podcasts, but I like the fact that my first few investments, Ben, I could get in my car and drive and physically see them. That gave me peace of mind. Yeah. And so invest in your backyard because you know it and you're more comfortable with it and because you have proximity to it. That's what I started with. And I think that played favorably for me in Metro Phoenix. I live in Scottsdale, Metro Phoenix, uh, the area I, I obviously knew a heck of a lot better than I would know anywhere else. And when you felt like you ran out of opportunities in Phoenix, you didn't go to New York or Toronto. I think the next major market you went to was Tucson, which yeah. I'm not super good. That's a couple hour drive away, right? You could still Tucson's, go see it. Tucson's two hours south. Yeah. And for me again, there was proximity. Obviously, it wasn't two minutes down the road. It was two hours. So if I wanted to, and believe it or not, Ben, I still do it periodically now, where I'm like, you know what? I want to listen to this book or this podcast. Where can I drive and be alone by myself 
and still accomplish something. So I will periodically drive down to Tucson and have, you know, a podcast on just physically see it. That gives me peace of mind. I want to see what's going on. Um, but I also had resources in Tucson, resources predominantly being people that I could trust, that that I can lean on, that can provide me information. But I want to, you know, you, you said it, and I just want to reemphasize it. I really aimed to, I don't want to say exhaust everything in Phoenix, because I certainly, I don't think that that's necessarily possible. But I played the Phoenix game until the math started to make less sense for me and competition increased. I am a big fan of playing in areas and markets where I have an advantage. And that advantage may be insider information that I have, or that advantage may be just a lot of people aren't doing the same thing I'm doing, and I'm comfortable with that. I, I love to compete, except in real estate investment. That's Once right. I start competing, then emotion comes in the, in the equation. And emotion is a killer when it comes to investment. Now, I'm going to ask you about, we're going to call it the where to invest list. And everybody, I want you to take notes on this because it's huge. But before I get to that, Brian, talk about some of the locations around the U.S. where you've, you've invested, just so they have an idea of either where you've looked at deals or where you've actually bought or sold. Just kind of give them a, a couple. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, we talked around Phoenix and, and how I eventually went to Tucson. Then you and I haven't chatted about this all that much, but the very next place I actually went that was outside Arizona, uh, was Washington state of Washington it was, uh, my, my first multiplex deal and my second and third multiplex multiplex would be, you know, a, a duplex four uh, triplex quad, whatever it may be just more than one door at the property, um, was in Puyallup. I was a big fan of the Puyallup market at the time. Why? I was traveling up that way quite often. As you may recall, in, in, in 2010, 11, 12, I spent a lot of time in C Seattle Metro. More importantly, though, I had really good connections up there that were sourcing opportunities. And so I ended up in Washington because it hit a lot of the things I was looking at. We're going to go through that list here in a bit. Uh, then, Ben, I ended up in other places like Birmingham, Alabama like Metro Cleveland, some suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, and some other small towns in, in other states. But I think today we'll have an opportunity maybe to talk about some of the Alabama opportunities in, in Ohio, just to kind of demonstrate there's deals everywhere. You and I made an offer together on a property in San Antonio uh, last month. We didn't come together, but that was a market that we looked at. And I bought in the last couple of years, Birmingham, Missoula, Boise, Salt Lake City, Napa, Midland, Texas, other areas of Texas. I think you're I think you're in Louisville, right? Or or no, Lake of the Ozarks. Um. Anyway, Southern Tennessee. Uh, Franklin, maybe. Uh, yeah, in Tennessee, some apartment buildings there. You know, anyway, so, so, so we we bought a yeah, lot. Yeah. Yeah, we, we we bought a lot of different areas, and a lot of the areas I bought in hit this list that you shared with me. So let's start off before we go into some deals. Let's go through the where to invest list. And I got, I'm counting seven, seven items for the list. It's in your workbook. So go to your workbook, open it up, and you're going to take notes. You're going to fill out Brian Gubernick's where to invest list. Uh, number one, Brian. Yeah. And these are in no exact order. So I don't want to imply that there's priority of one of these over another. Um, number one, for sake of this list, uh, when I'm looking at places to invest, I am actually looking at local government. And I'm looking at local government, Ben, for two reasons, two very different reasons. Uh, reason number one, the government is a very large employer. It's a larger employer in certain areas than, there, than it is in others. While this is not a great market to necessarily invest in, in my opinion, because the values are so high, the city of Austin as a pretty sizable government influence. Why? Because it's the capital of the state of Texas. And so government employs a lot. And I look at employment, Ben, as you know, and I know you do the same. We're very curious about the job market. We're very curious about employment in that area because employment means renter opportunity, means stable income, things of that nature. So I look at government, number one, for employment, reason number one for employment. But I also look at government, Ben, 
because of regulations imposed by local governments. So, and we won't go down this path too deep, but some governments are very supportive of long-term rentals and even short-term rentals, and other governments are not as supportive. Local governments are not as supportive. An example of not as supportive, in certain college towns, you may see more regulation around what it is you can, in fact, charge. There may be, and obviously there's in some, in some cities and states, there's different rate control and things of that nature. It's government influence. So I'm looking again, Ben, at government number one for both the employment purposes as well as for um, regulations. So if I, if I was going into a market that I didn't know, I would call a real estate professional or a title escrow company or a loan officer or all of them or some other investors. And I'd say, what is it that I should know that's different, weird, restrictive, uh, that your government has imposed on landlords or on renters that I should be aware of? Like, for instance, uh, one of the greatest investments I've made recently that turned into one of the worst investments that I've made recently was I bought a vacation rental to which when I bought it, I had to reapply for the property to be a vacation rental. And the government for that county decided that I could not rent it. So now I have a vacation rental that I cannot rent out as a vacation rental. And I should have done a little bit more looking. So you get caught in some of these things. That's one example of how it's bitten me in the bottom. Yeah, that was a, that was a good example. And I, Ben, I don't know if, if you could have done anything. You know, that one was one where I don't know if you went back over the course of history and examined how that government operated and you know what had they done. Maybe you could have picked that one up, but that was a you know that's difficult. It changes the entire structure of that investment deal. Sure does. Okay, number one, ladies and gentlemen, government, and that's because of employment and and politics or regulation. And Brian, what's the number two on uh, where we should invest list? Number two on, on my list is, is uh, hospitals and medical. Very similar to what I said, number one, with government and employment, uh, with hospitals and medical, call it health. Health is a major employer as well. So if a city, a town has a prominent um, um, health, uh, or hospital presence, doctor presence, um, you will see, you know, that does impact employment. That's a stable employer. I also look at hospitals and, and health then um, and doctors because call it what it is, um, our, our aging population, we have a baby boomer population. Access to healthcare is incredibly important. And many of those baby boomers, Ben, they're on fixed incomes or will be on fixed incomes. Fixed incomes likely mean more rentals, right? So, so I have a fixed income baby boomer on a, on a uh, you know, th that's going to rent a property of mine. What's going to drive them to rent a property of mine? Access to healthcare and things of that nature. So I want to know what kind of healthcare presence is in that city. Maybe the flip side of that, or maybe the opposite way to say that. If there isn't easy access to hospitals and healthcare, you're not going to lose everybody, but you will lose a portion of that population. There's no question. So I'm going to put number two on the list as health. And then we all know that that is because one, it creates jobs. And two, it improves the quality of life and the types of tenants that are available because so much of the population relies on access to good health care, depending on their age and so on. I love that. Number three. Brian, this is a little similar to some of the others, and I, and I love this one. It, it is similar. Um, education, specifically higher education and university. So higher education and university. Again, huge employer. There are certain cities that have a massive college presence, higher education presence. Cleveland has both medical. I mean, I'm drawn to Cleveland because of its health care. I'm also drawn to Cleveland because of the quantity of higher education around that area. Birmingham, very similar, higher education. So both from an employment standpoint, but it also impacts, it creates a pool of renters that otherwise may not exist. Those renters are known as students. So that may create opportunity for you. It also oftentimes, Ben, uh, indicates a, what's the word I would be looking for here? 
a, a, a more highly educated population. Just call it what it is. Higher education translates into higher income. Higher income translates into more st stable renters and more stable values. Again, you can look at a lot of these and say the opposite. What would the lack of higher education in that area look like? What would the lack of healthcare, the lack of government employment, how would that impact things? That might be another way to look at that. So I look at government, healthcare, and education. Um, they kind of all fall in that very similar bucket, Ben. I love number three. One, because I live in a college town, Bellingham, Washington, where you know, major university for our area, 16,000 students at Western Washington University. Two, I invest in markets that have, have uh, colleges like the one we bought in Tennessee. It really is all student housing. One of the things I loved about it is my very first duplex, Brian, I, I had uh, three bedrooms in each, each side of the duplex and each one of the bedrooms ended up being a college student. And I had three separate co-signers from each one of the parents for the entire rent, not just for their bedroom. So it was super protected. I never had a time when I didn't get my rent from at least one of the parents would cover it for everybody in the, in the place. So I love the security of that. Number four, Brian, I think is really fascinating. Tell us about what the fourth one. Yeah, the fourth one, I wanna know migration patterns. Very simply put, are people moving to or away from the area you're interested in in pursuing a rental opportunity. How would you find one, that? Uh, we, well, you know what, Ben, there's, a, frankly, if you just Google, you will find a fair amount of like, where are people moving from and to. Uh, there's actually uh, some great information put out there by, of all companies, Ben, U-Haul. Yep. Um, what do I mean when I say U-Haul? You all actually is leaned on pretty heavily by, by analysts to figure out where are people renting trucks one way? Where are they renting trailers one way? So if there is a high uh, quantity of individuals moving from, say, San Diego to Phoenix, U-Haul is what they're leveraging. The move from San Diego to Phoenix one way. So it's interesting to see migration patterns. For me, it's really just a, a stability issue. Like, are people moving away from where I want to, in fact, invest? It may not kill a deal, Ben, but it would be a red flag. It'd have to be something I'd investigate for sure. If the population is increasing, that would tell us that there's going to be more demand, potentially higher rents, lower vacancy rates. Like, all of that is a plus. Like, you don't want to be the last person in town, you know, that, what's the joke? You got to turn off the lights when you, when you leave. <laughs> Right. But we we saw this over COVID when people were moving from California, who was very, very re government restricted on jobs and, and so many other things. And they're moving to Nashville and they're moving to Boise and they're moving to Salt Lake City and they're moving to places like Phoenix and they're moving to places like Texas. So I think that's really fascinating that you mentioned that. And I love that you gave the tip that U-Haul has a lot of data on migration patterns. Let's go to number five, Brian. Well, Jack, can I say this one thing, one more thing on migration pattern, Ben, because I think it's really important. It's something I didn't understand early enough in my career, and I wish I did. I shouldn't say understand, I wasn't taking this action. Uh, and you know I do this today, I, 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 I'm obsessed over it. I am constantly trying to figure out where are big companies, prominent companies, opening up their next shop their next warehouse, their next big branch. Why? Because when they land in that city, it creates more employment opportunities. They bring people with them. Uh, uh, people have to move with them. So like in Phoenix right now, or outside Phoenix, we have Casa Grande, which is just south. We have Southeast Phoenix. There's a tremendous amount of investment from prominent companies in these areas. There, I know there's a shortage of housing to the, all the things you just said, greater demand and less supply. So when I say migration patterns, uh, I also want to include in there what companies are moving to these areas and who follows with those companies. Or what companies are leaving an area. Or what, yeah, fair yeah. enough. Right? Uh, number five, Brent. Crime. You know, I want to know what, 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 what crime or lack thereof there is in that, that city, that area. For That's all of the obvious reasons. Quality of life, number one. What's that? Quality of life. <laughs> Quality of life certainly matters as it pertains to crime. It goes without saying, higher crime rates create lesser demand. Lesser demand drives prices down. Uh, you also have upkeep and maintenance and all those things around that property in that neighborhood. 
These are things that impact value, impact rents. So I want to know, what are we dealing with here? You know, uh, I'm not, I don't necessarily need the absolute lowest crime, although it'd be really nice. I don't think I need the absolute lowest crime, but I could tell you, I don't want to be in high crime areas either. I have a rental property in a kind of a downtown corridor area. And last year I had the windows broken out of that property three times in a month because the unit ended up being vacant and they knew that they were kicking the windows in and moving in there. And it's an area that if I would have done the research, you would look up and say, that is high crime. Now, once it's filled, there's never any issues, but, but certain areas, the transient, transient population takes advantage of vacant homes. And you have to keep that in mind. Like, I'd rather have somebody in there for free for a month, just looking over the property than what I had to deal with during that time period. So number the, six. The, the truth is, as it pertains to crime, Ben, I mean, you know, you have, you'll run an area, you'll run an analysis, a math analysis of a home in, a, in an area that you don't yet know has high crime, and the numbers will be unbelievable. But I'll tell you why they're, more, why, why they're oftentimes unbelievable. It's because you're not factoring in that you're probably going to have higher maintenance and higher upkeep into your math equation. You're, yeah. under, you're undervaluing that cost. And so crime plays a big role. I think you want to get to the next one, though, which is schools. Okay. Right. So schools, when I say schools, I, I had already mentioned education, but I was talking higher education in university. The number six for me, I want to know the school system. Simply put, families care about schools. Just like when they're buying homes, they care about the school district. When they're renting homes, they have families, they have kids. They want to know what kind of, what kind of school uh, availability or school system is around me. That, again, drives demand to an area and creates stability. I, I represented one of the largest institutional buyers of homes in Washington State, Brian. They bought uh, hundreds of thousands of homes across the U.S. during the last eight or nine years. Most of you could probably pick out who that was. And one of their key criteria was the ra rating of the schools in that area. And they would only buy homes. And these are people that have billions of dollars to invest in real estate. They would only buy homes that were in the best rated schools in that particular county or area. I thought that was something interesting. And then, Brian, we have one last one that we should get to. Uh, what is that? Yeah, the very last one uh, we just would call rents versus current home values. Rents versus current values. To me, this is, and, and I don't want to go too deep in this, but many have heard about the 1% rule, um, things of that nature. Google it uh, if, you, if you'd like. But rents versus current values, I want to know what are these properties renting for and what does that market look like, like from a current value standpoint? Just as, a, as an eyeball, um, like I'm just eyeing it. Like For example, Ben, in Phoenix, it's very difficult for me to buy right now because the property values have, have frankly skyrocketed, but the rents have not kept up that same pace. And so when I look at current values and the growth of current values, and I look at rents and recognize rents have not paced the same as values in, in, in that particular city, to me, it's a red flag. These numbers, this math may not work out favorably for me. Again, I'm playing the cash flow game. So higher rents, are important, lower values relative to those current rents is important, right? Because lower values mean smaller investment by me in buying that asset. So this isn't make or break, we're just scrubbing, we're using this list to scrub an area to determine if it's one we should consider investing in. Well, let's just walk through a simple scenario of what the 1% rule is. So if I bought a property for $100,000, the 1% rule says that I should be able to rent it out for what amount per month? Yeah, thousand dollars. Thousand right? dollars. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar property, and and Ben, we're going to actually give an example here in a little bit that plays very closely to that math. Uh, you have a hundred thousand dollar property. Just a rule of thumb, standard rule of thumb. Uh, you don't don't marry yourself to this, but if you're eyeballing a property, if you're just trying to figure out on the fly, might this be worth looking at? If you find the one percent uh, rule applies, it might be worth digging into. So, like Ben said. There's a $100,000 property, and I could quickly see that rents are at least $1,000 a month, 1% of $100,000. That means that, barring anything that's kind of crazy or, 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 or kind of an anomaly, after you factor in, factor in your expenses, 
there's a good chance that the cash flow may be um, worth, it may be worth digging further into this property, may meet your needs in terms of cash flow. Just a rule of thumb, something that you can scrub any property uh, using that sort of that sort of metric, that sort of math. Hey everybody, you just heard the where to invest list from Brian. Prior to this, you heard the three or four reasons why you should invest and what you look for in investment. Uh, namely, we, we're looking for cash flow to start, but you might want to write down those other, other three as well. Now, I want to walk through some actual transactions. And if this episode goes really good, and you, audience, you're super into this, maybe I'll rope Brian to join Bob and I into doing an entire real estate investing series like the Wealth Series. We'll, we'll let you guys go into the Facebook group, facebook.com, go to the Win, Make, Give. And if you want a real estate investing series, just go in there and just tell us. And if we get enough people, I'll bribe Brian to do it with me. Now we're going to walk through some actual transactions. Brian, I, I want to keep it high level, but I want you to like tell us, let's start with one and then tell us the location, price, and then some of the things that made that property be a, a good investment or a good deal for you. Which one would you like to start with? What area, what property? You know what? Why don't we start with um why don't we start with Tucson? Okay. You know, Tucson for me, if you if you don't know about Tucson, so Tucson is a college town. I mean, it is a big city and does employ uh, a fair amount of people, but it's also where the University of Arizona is located. It's two hours south of Phoenix. I was drawn to Tucson, Ben, after I had really worked Phoenix and kind of understood, you know, the rental game. There's still a lot more for me to learn, but I had a good baseline understanding, was ready to expand beyond my backyard. Okay. So when I got down to Tucson a handful of years ago, I wanted to um, investigate owning properties that I could, in fact, rent to students. Okay. I liked that on paper. There are pros and cons to it. We could talk about it. But on paper, and from what I studied and read, I felt like this could be a good opportunity. One reason, and you already kind of you kind of took this one for me because I was gonna I was gonna lean into it. One reason is that for a larger home, you will have four, three, four, or five, you know, tenants or or friends all living together and their parents are likely co-signers as well. So I like that security. That also drew me down there. So Ben, I go down to Tucson and there's a property at 344 Linden. 344 Linden. I actually, at the same time, was buying, we're looking at another property at 744 Linden, almost the exact same floor plan. This property, Ben, at the time was a $210,000 property. And it was renting for nineteen hundred dollars a month. So almost, almost the one percent rule. Almost the one percent rule. Okay. So two hundred ten thousand dollars renting at nineteen hundred dollars per month. Okay. Okay. So that, to your point about the one percent rule, I'm like, that's intriguing. That's a much more affordable property relative to where I'm, where my backyard in Scottsdale and Phoenix, and the rent values are very much in line with the current property values. In other words, property values are not grossly outpacing rent. So we go down there, Ben, we look at that property, we like it a lot, and we put that deal together. When I say put that deal together, Ben, now at this, at this point, and I, I don't know if maybe you want to touch on this, Ben, this was not a second home for me. So I had to get commercial slash business financing. Uh, but... I had exhausted the lower down payment opportunities that may come with second home. Did you want to dive into that at all? Or did you want to? No, in the last episode, Brian, we, we talked a lot about buying owner occupied homes because you could put zero to three, 5% down and then renting it out and move to the next one. I don't know if in that episode, I forget if we talked about the ability to buy a second home because a lot of times second home financing allows you to buy a home with 10% down. But the reason we kept investment real estate as the second episode is because if you're truly investing, the amount down starts at 20%, 25%, or 30%, which is a lot of cash for a lot of people. And if you aren't buying owner-occupied real estate or you aren't buying the second home you're going to turn into a VRBO, then uh, this might be the next, you know, this is the next step after you're doing those things. So for this particular deal, what percentage did you have to put down? 
Yeah, on this one, Ben, I put 25% down. So $52,500 down. Okay. Okay. I also had some, some fixed up costs that I had to include just over $2,000. Then I also had to come out of pocket after I purchased this property. Okay. This particular property, I was able to get a loan for $157,500. So I had $52,500 down. And the balance was one fifty seven five hundred. Okay. I was able to get a loan at a 5% interest rate at that time. Not horribly far off from what rates are today, by the way. No, not okay. at all. Now, again, this was years back. So this was before that significant dip that we saw in rates, yeah. but a slight bit less than where, they, where, they're, where they're at today. Yeah. So all in, Ben, without going too far into the weeds, my cash on cash return, remember, I had a total of about $54,000, $55,000 out of pocket, which again was down payment plus the fixed up costs I had to get the property to where I wanted to be, rather nominal. My cash on cash return, so when I collected the rent, paid the expenses, that net amount that I received on an annual basis, divided by the dollars I had, I had invested, was just over 16.5%. That is 16.5% return then on my cash. Which and basically I means if I took if I take 16.5 and divide that by 100, or 100 divided by 16.5, that basically means that in six years, if you did nothing to increase rents and you had no other incomes that you thought of, you would have all of your down payment back in six years. And hypothetically, in six years, you could go do the same exact thing again. Exactly right. Now, and, and I love that you always you always throw that in there whenever you and I have the opportunity to teach and train together around this, that you always bring emphasis back to that 16% cash on cash return means 16 times six, six years, 100% of your cash is now back in your pocket. You are essentially in this deal now for nothing and it is cash flowing and your, and your risk, which is what your dollars in that property are no, no longer exposed and ready for something else. It's, now, it's something I live by, Brian. Like I want my money back so I can do it again. And a lot of people, they buy rental properties to say they own one, but they don't have enough cash. It'll take them 30 years to get their down payment back. That just means every 30 years with that same money, they can only do it once. I want to do it five or seven times in that 30 year period or 10 times or 20 times or whatever that number might be. So I, I love that. Keep going. Yeah. So, so and there's there's a cap rate calculation to this as well, Ben. I don't know if you want to go down that path, but the income of this property against its value was rather high as well. Now, I'm not done there though with that that particular property. Okay. I um you know, so I've had that property, I still have it today uh for what it's worth. Um last time I looked at it, it's worth like 350, 360,000. Okay. You know, so I have another you know, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in equity plus. Don't forget the original fifty-two thousand five hundred I put down. So I have a couple hundred thousand dollars in equity in that property. Yep. I don't really care because why, Ben? Because of cash flows. I'm not it cash flows, yeah, and I'm not, sell, sell, I'm not selling. I'm not selling that property, right? Because yep. you've taught me the key to being poor is selling assets <laughs> that appreciate up. cash flow. So yep. I'm not selling that thing anytime soon. Uh, but one thing that we did there that I think everybody, if you own one rental property or dozens of rental properties, it's something you can go and apply right now and up your cash flow on all of your properties. On this particular property, Ben, uh, I actually went to Home Depot and I bought a $300 to $400 storage, uh, shed, storage shed. And I dropped that $400 shed, Ben, in the backyard of this property, locked it up, and told the tenants, the next tenants I had on uh, in that property, hey, by the way, we have additional storage at the property that I personally use, but I am more than happy to clear it out and I would uh, rent it out to you for an additional $25 a month. Okay? Now that may not sound like much, guys. I, I, I get it, $25 a month. You're like, really, Brian? Well, $2,500 a month, $300 a year, do that on 10 properties. Now it's a few thousand more dollars that you didn't have yesterday. And in year one, I pay off all of the storage facilities, like whatever they cost me in that example. And now it's pure cash after that. So good. 
to me, I just look at these properties and I'm oftentimes asking myself, what other value can I create that would warrant them paying a few more dollars, right? Storage for $25. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go off on a total tangent, Ben, but storage is like a major, major thing for uh, citizens here in the United States. Like everybody wants storage and that the garage is never enough. So yep. you may say, hey, Brian, $25, are you really going to nickel and dime them like that? Well, I'm either going to sell them on storage or they're going to go down to the local storage, the local garage and, and spend money there. That's just the truth. I love it. I love it. And I've done little things like I added a bedroom on a house once because I knew a four bedroom would rent an extra four or $500 a month. I have a detached garage on one of my properties, Brian, that I rent out to somebody else because the tenants didn't necessarily need it or want it. So there are lots of ways if you think create creatively to maximize your cash flow. Just out of curiosity, have the rents gone up? Are they still 1900 or what are they now? Just The rents have not actually dramatically increased. Uh, this one is presently rented for 2150. Okay. So you would call that, um, I don't know, what's a 12, 13% increase since I took it on. Yeah. Yep. Um, but they've gone up. Now, yep. I, I do want to mention, like, there is always, you know, there's upsides to all properties. There's some downsides here too, Ben. Right? Like college town, five people living in a house, five guys or girls, doesn't matter, or maybe a mix, but they're college kids nonetheless. So I have college kids problems. I have things that break that don't normally break in a house. I have holes in walls. I have screens that are, you know, missing suddenly. Right now, this property, Ben, no joke. I got a picture last week uh, from, from like an inspector that I have that kind of tours the properties. There's like three couches in the backyard. I have no idea why those couches are there. It's just what college kids do. So I have college kid problems. I budget for it both financially and mentally. Yeah, I love that. And that's just the way it goes. We got we got time for maybe one more deal, maybe two. So let's let's go through another deal. Uh, what do you want to do for the next one? You know, why don't we do something rather straightforward and simple because it was one percent rule. Uh, I, I think we ought to talk about the Birmingham deal we just did. We literally just did this one two weeks ago, Ben. Now it was a pure cash deal, but we can talk around like what the end game, what the plan may be. Yeah, so I, I have. I don't know, 15, 20 properties in Birmingham myself. And as I think about your list, although I haven't thought about it, it really does check all those, all those boxes. You know, Birmingham's, a, I think, a great community. It's, it's being rebuilt and revitalized. And there's a lot of great diversity and, and education and hospitals and jobs and all that kind of stuff. So I, so I love the market. But it's also one of the places in the United States where you can buy really, truly affordable housing. And if you're a good landlord and you do good things to it, you can provide very quality housing at an affordable price. So walk us through this particular deal in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, what'd you buy? Yeah, really straightforward deal here. And everybody could find this deal. I'll tell you why. Ben, I found this one on Zillow. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, right now, there is there are more properties on market that have been sitting for longer periods of time that we've experienced in the past few years. Even though if you've been through real estate cycles and you've been around as long as Ben and I have, uh, you know, it's not that much time on market. We lived in the days where properties were listed for a year and didn't sell. But if properties sit on the market for 60 or 90 or 120 days, unfortunately, people are panicking. And this particular property, or many properties, I should say, uh, are sitting longer and I actually, because I'm sick and twisted, Ben, I will peruse Zillow and I will read the realtor remarks. And things like seller will entertain all offers or quick sale needed or back on market willing to, you know, whatever it may be, you know, the language that you can see in there. I actually look for that because to me, that says maybe they're interested in an offer that isn't exactly at list. So this particular property band listed on $115,000. I contacted uh, a friend of ours, Ben, that's a local realtor in that area. And I asked her if we can buy that property at $95,000. So I wanted to make an offer. And I said, there is no room for negotiation. Now, I meant that. Like, I'm not going back and forth. There's too many options, too many properties available. Uh, 
I did come up for a couple of reasons, but I came up to $98,000, Ben. I bought this property off of the MLS, which was through Zillow, for, for $98,000. Okay. This property's in, in an up-and-coming neighborhood of Birmingham, 6830 uh, First Avenue South. You can look it up if you'd like. And um, we just rented it today, Ben, uh, two days on the rental market total. We rented it for $1,050. So 98K in, I paid cash 98K, 98,000. And we rented it for 1050. What you're going to find is that math is going to work out very favorably on a cash on cash when you factor in expenses like property management and taxes and all of that. You're going to have all your money back with a paid off property in eight years. Yep. Now, you oh, didn't that- have to. Everybody listening, you don't have to pay 98000 in cash because literally you could find a local bank in Birmingham and get 20 or 25% down and put twenty or $25,000 down on this property. You could still rent it out for 1050 and you would have your down payment back in three years or four years or whatever that amount is. Yeah, believe it or not, depending on the terms that you're able to negotiate on that loan, you might find a higher cash on cash return than I'm getting right now with all of my cash in this property. In other words, if I have a $20,000 down payment, I may actually, you know, when you run the math out, you may find a higher cash on cash return. So I, but presently right now, Ben, I have now one quick note, because you said it, I just, I think it's so important. I recommend, and I know you feel the same, wherever you're buying, be it your backyard or another town, establish a local bank relationship. In Birmingham, Alabama, I used the First Bank of Alabama. In in Cleveland, Ben, I used Buckeye Bank. Why do I use these local banks? Because I'm a real estate investor. My tax returns look different. There's things I can do with a local bank by establishing a relationship and showing that I'm a repeat customer that allows me more flexibility with loan products when opportunities come up. And you always use a real estate professional when Always. you buy out of area, which, which I do as well. And whoever invited you to the wealth series, most likely that person is a real estate agent or, you know, one. So if you're thinking about investing outside of your area and you want to get connected to a great agent in Cleveland or Birmingham or Boise or any of these markets, ask your agent that invited you. There's a good chance that they know somebody great that's already knows a property manager and already knows repair people and already has great investments available in markets like Birmingham or Tucson or wherever in the world you decide. Now, Brian, there's another phrase that everybody uses called burr. And, and burr, uh, it's not something I do a ton because I, it's, not, it's just not really my, my method, but I do wanna bring it up. Burr means buy, renovate or repair, rent it out, and then refinance. So if Brian wanted to, even though he paid 98,000 cash, he could go in there, clean it up a little bit, put a nice renter in there, go back to one of his local banks and say, hey, I got this property, it's rented out. And they might come back and say, Brian, we think it's worth 130 now or 120 now and give Brian an 80% loan. And he might actually get all of his cash back into his pocket the whole 98 grand or, or the vast majority of it. That is an option for people. If you've ever heard the phrase burr, go to your workbook and write down what burr means by renovate or repair, rent, and then refinance to pull your money out. That's just tip for the workbook. Brian, do we have time for another deal or two? I want to, I want to talk about a really, really great type of affordable housing that a lot of the world relies on and somebody that's really dipping their toes into real estate investing very potentially could do one of these transactions. Do you know which types I'm talking about? Yeah, Ben, you know, I am a, I'm a very big fan of the mobile home game. I just, I am a big fan of the mobile home game for a multitude of reasons. Maybe the biggest one, the simple fact that for those listening today, there are many deals to be had with nominal dollars out of pocket yet amazing returns uh, on, on, on these homes. Uh, mobile homes, Ben, you know, here, let, let's just call it what it is. We have an affordable housing crisis in this country. For sure. Take that and couple it with the fact that many governments 
uh, or towns and municipalities, for whatever reason, do not want to approve the construction or build out of new mobile home parks and things of the like. Yeah. So you have no affordable housing, and then you have an option that is affordable, considering you know the options. But you have something that is affordable, yet local um, governance or municipalities do not want it. And so from an investor standpoint, to me, that's ripe for opportunity, right? You've got high demand, low supply. And as I mentioned, I also don't love competition. If I can avoid it when it comes to real estate investing, let's do it. Well, you, you tend to find lesser competition in this space. I think we have to run through a deal if we could, Ben. There's a couple of different things we could do with mobile homes and maybe it'd be worth kind of talking through with, you know, a, a recent deal we did. I, I would love that. You know, mobile home investing could come in a few ways. One, you could buy a mobile home and put it on a vacant piece of land that you own. You could buy a mobile home that's already on land because it's affordable housing. You could have a home on your land already. And if the zoning allows, you could add an additional unit like a mobile home to increase your cash flow. Or you can also, as Brian's talking about, invest in rental properties that are in mobile home parks where you don't actually own the land. You got to pay a lot rent for that spot, but you do own the manufactured home that's on there. Now, I was raised in a single wide trailer with my mom. And I remember, Brian, those single wide trailers, which ours were probably built in the 60s, being cold and and not very nice and having single pane windows and having a lot of mold and and rats and all kinds of problems. Now, even though there is some of those types of trailers on on parks in America today, there's also quite a few that have better insulation than the house I am today, that have single pane window windows better than the house I'm in today, probably have better appliances than the house I'm in today. Like th there are a lot of great homes in parks or on land so don't necessarily take your head and say, that's not for me or that's not great. These are great housing opportunities. So I just want to kind of do that precursor, Brian, and then take us through a deal or, or go wherever you want. It's so, I mean, I love it. It's so important, right? Because even the communities, Ben, that I'm in are nicer than traditional housing communities, right? And I think part of that is, Ben, you've got this aging population again on a fixed income that want to own something that's in fact affordable. So there's pride of ownership, right? There's a certain generation that maybe treated things differently. And, and, and that's why I love working with. And frankly, that's who I'm selling a lot of these mobile homes to or doing deals with. So let's talk through this particular mobile home opportunity. Uh, ben, yell at me as I know you will if I kind of take us off to a different place. But I want to kind of talk about the different options we have in mobile homes, okay? Okay, fire away. So this particular mobile home deal um, I went into a handful of mobile home parks in Metro Phoenix, and I told the management there, any property, any mobile home that you take back, that you suddenly now own as the, as the mobile home park, call me, I will take it off of your hands. Now, what do I mean when I say take back? Mobile home parks, many of them are simply leasing the land that the mobile home sits on. So you pay land rent. The home itself is then in fact put on that land. If a tenant of the land stops making their land payment to the park, the park uses that mobile home as its collateral. Okay? So in many mobile home parks, when people stop paying the land rent, they take that home as their collateral. So I ask these parks, call me when you have a situation like that, I will buy the property. This particular deal, Ben, uh, here in West Phoenix um, at 2650 West Union Hills, number 191, I uh, was exactly one of those. I went to the park and it was a rather sizable mobile home and I uh, bought that property, took it off their hands for $12,000. Now, the thing was not in fantastic condition. It was beat up, it was worn down. However, keep in mind, it's a $12,000 mobile home. So I did repairs, Ben, on this particular property of $5,500. Now, many would think, well, $5,500 is not a ton of repairs. Well, it's, all, it's, it's, 40, it's 40 to 50% of the property's value that I bought it for. 
So the repairs were actually significant. So I buy the property for $12,000, Ben, and I have $5,500 into it. So I'm $17,500 in. Okay. So I could stop there. Right now, just pause, just stop. Okay. If I, if I, if I wanted to just make this a rental, I could have turned around and rented this property out. They would have paid uh, $700 in land rent. It doesn't come to me. It's going to the park. I would have probably charged them another $300 to $400 to rent the mobile home from me. So the all-in payment for that tenant would have been $1,000 to $1,100, of which three to four hundred is mine. So let's just call it 400 for sake of conversation. 400 per month to me. And my initial investment, if you recall, was 12,000 plus the repairs I did of 5,500. So I was into it for 17,500, Ben. I could have rented it out for $400 a month. That's $4,800 annually. You can back into the math. I'll just leave you at, that's a heck of a return. Roughly, you'd have all your money back in 3.5 years. Yeah. Cash on cash return. So if I wanted to rent this particular home, I could. Okay, what are my other you know, options? If you've been listening, you've been like, okay, well, if you didn't rent it, why would you sell it, Brian? Because that's not passive income. I think that goes against what you were saying. Well, I did sell this one, Ben, but when I sold it, I, I became the bank. I offered what's called seller financing, owner financing. So let's go back to this deal. I'm $17,500 into this. I put it on the MLS, Ben, and I sold it for $49,000. I'm 17,500 into it. I sold it for $49,000. Now, how did I get such a high price? Well, again, high demand for this sort of thing, but it's really difficult to get financing for, an, for a buyer. It's very difficult to get financing on a mobile home. There's not a lot of lenders that alone. But I will, I will be the bank. And if I'm the bank, I can charge a premium if I want, because there's nobody else in the lending space for mobile homes. So it, it, I could get a premium on price. The max still works out favorably though, so stick with me. So I sold this for $49,000, Ben. When I sold it for $49,000 and I'm the bank, I asked the buyers to put down $6,000. That was, that was a number they could afford and a number that I'm comfortable with. So they had $49,000 sales price. They put down $6,000. Now they have, I have $6,000 in my pocket. I had $17,500 originally. So I'm actually total cash invested, Ben, of $11,500. Does that math make sense? Yep. Okay. I'll own. I have a $43,000 loan that I've now made to this buyer. After charging interest, to this buyer and having a 20 or I think a 30 year note is what I did on this. It was maybe 20, between 20 and 30 years. Fast forwarding through all of this, I had 11,500 in on an annual basis right now, Ben, I make $3,800 in interest. They're paying me roughly, uh, actually I won't even say rough. I have the numbers right here in front of me. They are paying me uh, 300 and, or I'm sorry, 400, $402.70 is their monthly payment to me. Of that $402.70, about $315 of that is interest. In year one, I collected about $3,800 in interest on my $11,500 net investment. I'm the bank. I gave them a loan. Every single month, they are making loan payments to me and I'm collecting interest. They own the home. I don't own it but I have passive income because I created a $43,000 loan off of what proved to be just an $11,500 investment. I, I did the math, what you're doing here. And over that term of the loan, you will collect $113,400 in interest plus the principal uh, of 11,000, oh, no, of 43,000. 40, 43, yeah, 43, so roughly $150,000 plus your down payment of $656,000 on a $17,500 cash investment. Ben, the worst day with a deal like this is when, it, for me as the investor, 
is when I no longer get that money in my mailbox, that $400 payment. As when the they pay it off. When they pay it off. Now, kudos to them. I'm excited for them. But the trade now, why would someone do that? Well, if they go and rent the same property, I gave you an example earlier, they would be renting for roughly $1,100 to $1,200. Now they're buying and owning for $700 or $800 land rent plus the $400 to me. Basically, they're buying a property from me at the exact same amount that they would be renting it for, but it's theirs. They get to own it. They get to control it. They get to do whatever they want. They get to sell it if they want to. They get to, I love it. Yeah. These, the types of deals that you can learn from studying people like Brian or listening to the Wealth Series, or if, remember, if any of you want, go into the Facebook group and tell us you want a real estate investing series and maybe, maybe we'll, we'll make a nice one for you. There's lots of different opportunities. Like you can't ever say, well, it's not for me or I don't have money. Brian, I've probably done seven or eight owner financing deals in my life. And I've done a couple of them where I put no money down. Now there's some more advanced techniques that we could teach in a real estate investing series, like, like wraps and, and that kind of stuff. And maybe we'll do that there. Today's not the right time for it. But I want, what I want everybody to know is that you can be a real estate investor. You can be 18 years old and be a real estate investor. You can be 79 years old and be a real estate investor. Real estate investing is for anybody going through the well series. If you start studying and coming up with a plan to do that, my advice has always been buy your own home first, do those things, and then start investing outside like Brian has done. Brian, uh, it's a really long podcast episode. So why don't you just, you wanna wrap us up with any wisdoms or thoughts? Uh, about real estate investing or or anything that you want to end us with that's really amazing? No, I don't know if I have anything amazing for you, Ben. The only thing I would I just reiterate, and you've been all, everyone's been going through the wealth series, you know, listening to all these podcasts. And I think one thing that shines, one thing that comes out of all these talks is kind of understand your mission, understand why you're doing what you're doing and create a plan and be diligent in finding that and following that plan, be consistent with it, Right. Like, don't just say, I want to create passive income. That's great. But how much? And when you have that much, what's it mean to you? What are you going to do with it? I would add a motion to this. I would set a goal and I would, I would write out a plan to execute. So I guess my advice, Ben, is all this stuff's a lot of fun. I wouldn't do it haphazardly. It becomes a lot more fun when it's part of a bigger mission and you're out there accomplishing it using these various strategies. Let's, let's end with... Uh... Another list, everybody. I'm going to give you a couple of real estate investing books uh, that I think you all should read. And Brian started with the first one. It's not really a real estate investing book, but it is uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Brian, in the month of December, it was the number one selling book in America. No, 10, crazy. 12, 15 years, however long ago, last, last month, it was the number one selling book in America. But I would add The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan. I would add a book that you told me about uh, called The Wealthy Code by George Antone. And he has two other books about uh, debt and, and being your own bank called The Banker's Code and The Debt Millionaire. Any other real estate investing books that you would add to our list that, that's popping in your mind? No, there's not. I, 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 uh, I mean, you kind of hit the, the, the big ones to me. The only thing I'd mention, Ben, is you know, you have friends over, we have friends over at Bigger Pockets, and I think that they put a good amount of material out that's very yeah, valuable. Like David, David Green, one of the hosts of Bigger Pockets, wrote a book called Long Distance Investing. For those of us that, that don't have great deals in our own market or don't have deals that you can come up with a down payment, like you maybe live in San Francisco and you're thinking, I don't have that much down, but you sure could have that much down for a place in Birmingham. And you do enough of those, you could actually buy a home for cash in San Francisco over time. So that's a great suggestion. Ladies and gentlemen, go to winmakegive.com and make sure that you sign up for the Wealth Series. It's forward slash wealth. Download the workbook. Participate in, in this entire session. If this is the first time listening, go back and listen to the other episodes. And we have quite a bit more before we wrap up the Wealth Series. Brian, thank you for joining us today. Bob, Chad, and I are really grateful to have you contribute to the Wealth Series. Thank you. You know... We've covered a variety of things, buying in different parts of the U.S., different types of properties, deals when we had money, deals when we had no money, 
yep. deals that made sense and deals that turned out as a disaster. I hope that, that you leave this part of the wealth series with a belief that you could be a real estate investor and that you could build wealth through real estate. It's not that complicated. It takes some time, but there's people out there just like you that started just where you're at today that are making it really, really far in their wealth journey through real estate. Yes. It's going to take you reading books and listening to podcasts and networking and working with the agent that invited you to the wealth series and just going in that journey. But what I hope you do is I hope you think about it, dream about it, and take the first couple steps. Anything you guys want to add? I'm excited to go take a couple of these steps. Like I said, you know, at the, at the front of this episode, this was Aaron and I's kind of next move. So I was just as much a, you know, a listener on the other side of the, the, the podcast as I was even. Like, Aren't you usually? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just get to be a little bit closer to the, to the action, right? But yeah, I mean, yeah. Ben, it's a relentless pursuit of greatness that you are bringing to our audience by being able to give us all this information so that we can all go out there and create whatever we consider greatness in our own world and in our wealth plan and wealth strategy. I think the difference with the wealth series part de 2.0, whatever the improved, the remake, the expanded, <laughs> whatever we're going to call it is we, we've added more tools. We've expanded the workbooks with conversation topics and things for you to talk about. Uh, and we've brought in other people. We brought in investing experts. You're going to hear from some tax experts going forward and real estate invex experts. We brought in some people to, to hear from a different perspective, and we hope you just really, really love the Well Series. We're, we're getting towards the end. Make sure you fill out the workbooks and you answer the homework questions because you're about to win some serious prizes and serious cash if you jump through all the hoops. We're really, really excited. And uh, as Chad said, we'll see you in the Facebook group. Reach out to us if you have any questions. And uh, if you can't else you find say? any of the resources, anything you're looking for, check the pinned posts. They'll be at the top of the Win Make Give group, folks. As always, do good. Do good.